Hello, welcome to Chapter 3 Podcast, the show for readers of science fiction, fantasy, and romance. This is Season 1, Episode 7. I'm Bethany, your host, and joining me today is children's librarian and booktuber Ashley from Bookish Realm. In today's episode, we'll be talking about YA science fiction and fantasy. If you want to support the podcast and get early access to episodes and exciting bonus content from all of our guests, check out our Patreon linked in the show notes. Before our conversation today, it's time for On My Radar, where I'll share recent or upcoming book releases in science fiction, fantasy, and romance that I'm excited about, and then our guests will have the opportunity to share one as well. The books for today's episode will be released between December 22nd, 2020 and January 5th, 2021, with the exception of the guest recommendation, which may include any upcoming release. First up, on December 29th, we have three titles from Random House Books for Young Readers. We've got Black Canary Breaking Silence by Alexandra Monier. This is a YA origin story for Black Canary, billed as The Handmaid's Tale meets the DC Universe. Sounds like fun. Then from St. Martin's, we're getting The Princess and the Rogue by Kate Bateman. This is a historical romance following a princess in disguise, forced to live with a rogue in order to protect her from danger. Finally, from Zebra Books, we have Fairy Godmothers Incorporated by Sarana DeWild, where fairy godmothers in a small Midwestern town interfere in the love lives of locals. Then on January 5th, I've got four things to talk about. First up from Bloomsbury, we are getting a boxed set of the ACOTAR series by Sarah J. Mass in the new covers. These have been reprinted with new covers targeted at an adult audience this time. Mixed reception on, on the new covers, but if you're looking for a boxed set of those coming January 5th. Then from Saga Press, we've got Persephone Station by Stina Liked. This one is a queer space opera for fans of The Mandalorian and Cowboy Bebop, and this one has a really, really stunning cover. Um, very striking cover. From Sourcebooks Fire, we've got Be Dazzled by Ryan Lasala. This is a romantic YA coming-of-age story that sounds like a lot of fun. It's billed as Project Runway Goes to Comic-Con in an epic queer love story about creativity, passion, and finding the courage to be your most authentic self. Lastly, from Disney Hyperion, we've got Lore by Alexandra Bracken. This one is a retelling of Greek mythology set in modern-day New York City in a tale of power, destiny, love, and Redemption. This is one I definitely have my eye on. Please join me in welcoming Ashley to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Of course. Thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be fun. If you want to briefly introduce yourself to our listeners and share your pick for an exciting upcoming release. Sure. So as Bethany has said, my name is Ashley. I run a channel on YouTube by the name of Bookish Realm. I am a U Services librarian, so I am super invested in all things related to children's middle grade and YA lit. One release, which this was so hard to choose a release that I've been <laughs> at it for in the upcoming year, would probably have to be The Gilded Ones by Namina Forna which is due to come out on February 9th. It was slated to come out this year, but of course, because of COVID and everything, it got pushed back. But it is a YA fantasy, a debut fantasy, where a young girl is about to enter a blood ceremony and her blood is supposed to turn red. But then during the ceremony, her blood turns gold and she gets the opportunity to fight with other immortal girls with rare gifts. So this one has gotten a lot of buzz, and I know that Fairy Loot put out a very, very pretty edition of it, a paperback edition of it, for individuals to get copies of before it was released next yes. year. Yes, yeah, it's, that's one I've definitely been interested in. And then you had another one as well? Yes. So one that I'm actually currently reading, and that one is Which is Steeped in Gold by Sienna Smart, mm. which comes out on April 20th. So this one is a Jamaican-inspired YA fantasy, and it focuses on two girls. One is the daughter of the queen, and the other is a prisoner. And there's something funny about the way the queen acquires her her power, so mm -hmm. they're both two, the both, both of the girls are witches and I think that they're going to end up working together against her, but I'm just excited because it's a Jamaican inspired fantasy and my dad's side of the family is Jamaican. 
That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that I've read, uh, oh, at least for YA, I don't know that I've read anything like that before. I haven't. I haven't seen anything in YA that has been Jamaican inspired. So this will be a first mm-hmm. for me. Yeah, that's cool. Well, and I know with the other one you were talking about, what was interesting to me about Namina Forna is she partly based the story on her own experiences being a war refugee. Yes, yes. So I heard. Yeah, which is super fascinating. So I've heard that it's like more intense in terms of the, the violence, but that part of it was wanting to give voice to that experience. That's what I was wondering. I was about to say, I wonder if that's going to be a hard hitting. <laughs> I think, I, yeah, yeah it sounds like it's going to be. <laughs> I know we were just talking about this. <laughs> yeah, you tend to read a lot of hard hitting stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But back to the hard hitting stuff. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I don't mind it actually in fantasy and sci fi. Uh, I think, I think for me, having the speculative element to it gives it enough of an emotional buffer that it doesn't like usually affect my own anxiety or like mental health. And so I can deal with it better. Yeah. But yeah, that's interesting. Well, and this is great because we're talking today about why science fiction and fantasy. And I think right now in particular is a really interesting and exciting time, especially for YA fantasy. We could talk about YA sci-fi, which is its own beast yeah (laughs) yeah not always done as well but in terms of fantasy I feel like it's a really exciting time for YA fantasy right now Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to hear your perspective on that as like a creator and as a librarian so as a librarian I can definitely see the changes in YA fantasy from the time that I started working in the library to now which is almost coming up on five years So I've seen the progression of what has come in and out of our system in terms of YA fantasy. And it's gotten a lot better in Mm. terms of just record or in terms of representation, in terms of story development and interest level, I think is a little bit more different. I see more kids now Mm -hmm. reading fantasy than I've seen in a while. And that's just my experience. When I was working at a different location a couple years ago, it was starting to pick up. A lot of the kids were more interested in reading contemporary, Mm -hmm. more books that related to their real life experiences in a non, in a non-fantastical setting. But then all of a sudden it just became, I need fantasy. I need fantasy. I need fantasy, which I think is great. I think that's really, Mm -hmm. really great. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I I don't see that kind of that side of things, obviously, mm-hmm. not being a librarian. I've always been a fan of fantasy, but it's interesting to hear that it's been picking up. I do I know what I do see a lot of is exciting things that are kind of pushing boundaries and like you said, also having just so much more representation mm-hmm. in the things that are getting published. And that has been pretty cool to see. Yeah, it it definitely has been uh, because I'm working with I'm working with a completely different population than I was maybe two and a half to three years ago. So Mm -hmm. the kids that I'm working with now are finally getting the opportunity to not only see themselves in contemporary settings, but also see themselves in fantasy settings. Yeah, I think has lended a hand to them being more interested in picking up fantasy. And I, I don't know if fantasy has had the reputation amongst teens in general, like in a library setting of being not interesting because I don't, I don't, I don't know personally. Cause like you, I've been interested in fantasy for a long time. You know, even growing up, I was really into fantasy. Yeah. But I don't know if, the kids that I'm seeing now, if their perceptions have changed because the representation has changed, but I think it has, I feel like there's, they're more inclined to pick up books in the fantasy genre because now they see characters that look like them or just characters that they can relate to more than they have been in the past. 
Yeah, which I think makes sense. I, I've seen a lot of people talking about that, that it can be game changing to be able to see people who are like you or look like you or feel like you in the books that you're reading. And particularly in fantasy, I think for a long time, it had been very dominated by white narratives, Western narratives, often male narratives. Um, and that seems to be shifting. And particularly in in YA fan, I mean, I think in general, but in YA fantasy, I think we're seeing a lot of interesting, exciting new books coming out that are centering, mm-hmm. you know, queer c- characters and characters of color and are telling fantasy stories that aren't based in uh, Western mythology or based yeah. in like, you know, medieval Europe. And that I think <laughs> also is really interesting. <laughs> that is true. What are some books that you've seen in the last few years that you think are particularly exciting or interesting or books that you're seeing a lot of teenagers gravitate towards in the population you're serving? Ooh, in the past? That's a tough question, Bethany. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness gracious, that is a tough question. You know, okay. This this is, this is crazy, but... So, mm. believe it or not, Children of Blood and Bone is still it's still a big thing amongst my kids. Mm. It, even wow. though <laughs> I have my thoughts about that, second book, <laughs> my kids Same. are it, are really really into it, and mm. it never ceases to amaze me that that book alone I can never keep on my shelf. Wow. I have to steal it from other locations and do some <laughs> finagling work on the inside to make it look like it belongs to my my branch. Uh, <laughs> but I can't ever keep it. So that always that always surprises me because I thought maybe, you know, with with some with some ending of the buzz going around with it, you mm-hmm. know, it kind of it would kind of wear off because I think that book came out in like 2017, right? If I'm not right. mistaken. Uh I would yeah, I guess yeah, so. Yeah, 2017. I would think like, okay, 2017, three years later, that book should probably be sitting on a shelf by now, but mm-hmm. it's not. Wow. Um, so that That's one I do have difficulty keeping. And this is what's also crazy. I still have kids who come in that are interested in starting the Mortal Instruments, which I find huh. fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> And I never ask why, Mm -hmm. because I think that, you know, of course, Cassandra Clare has written so much now. I mean, that world itself is so expansive. Yeah. But I'm always shocked about kids that come in and they want to start the series for the first time, considering how old the first book is. So I'm not even really sure where that side of it is coming from. Is the um, show still running, Shadowhunters? No, the show got canceled. Huh. So the show is not running anymore. So that's the one series that I see move in and out that mm-hmm. I can't quite put my finger on why hmm. there is such a high level of interest in that. But I think for me too, in working with my kids, it's still a little different because a lot of kids, once again, that I work with are not necessarily reading on grade level. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit more difficult sometimes when I'm looking at YA fantasy because I have to think about things that are accessible for them and where they're at in their reading. And yeah. sometimes YA fantasy can be a little too much in terms of length and density. Like I'm sitting here literally looking at a <laughs> legend born <laughs> and <laughs> as much as I love that book. And as much as I know some of my kids will love that book, I know that a good portion of my kids will not be able to access that book just yet because mm-hmm. they're not ready. So yeah. a lot of times too, it's trying to find substitutes for books that they can enjoy that may be fantasy, that they wouldn't be embarrassed to carry around, like if they're taking it to school. And that, mm-hmm. to be honest with you, is, it's hard. Yeah. It's really, really hard to to do that because yeah. as much as I love the genre, um, 
reading wise, it, it can be hard for some kids. Yeah. One series that always, I mean, and I don't know, I'm not a librarian, so, (laughs) but, but one, but one series that always struck me as being something that I could see appealing more to a younger YA audience potentially is the Brooklyn Bruja series by Zoretta Cordova. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I haven't. And I own like book one and book three, something (laughs) random like that. (laughs) They're really good. Um, But they're, they're interesting because they, at least to me, they read like, okay, I could give this to like a 13 year old and I think it would be fine, you know? I haven't tried that yet. It's so weird because I end up scaling down to upper level middle grade to kind of help Mm -hmm. me a little bit Mm -hmm. with that. And to be honest with you, the Rick Riordan Presents line has been golden Mm -hmm. (laughs) for that. That's that's really helped kind of build that gap. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's I guess it's interesting because it's it's two separate issues too, right? There's the the content of like what's going to be appealing to mm-hmm. the age versus like the level of difficulty, which yeah. is a whole separate issue, I guess. Which is why I I don't know. This is not she didn't write um why a fantasy, but it's a good example of what I wish would be done a little bit more in YA fantasy is Ashley Woodfolk work to create contemporary high low books, which I've started mm-hmm. talking about a little bit more, which is high interest, low difficulty. Mm-hmm. And a lot of high low books are not written by high profile authors. So it, they're, they're mm-hmm. out there, but I don't know if the kids would really be interested in picking them because it's not something that everybody talks about. Right. But I wish that concept was brought over to YA fantasy where there could be a set of books that are that are high low. That yeah. but the concept itself is is kind of hard, I think, to put that into fantasy because mm-hmm. the books tend to be a little bit shorter. So a lot would have to be packed in into Mm -hmm. a shorter text and I don't know how that would work with fantasy authors or whether they would feel comfortable doing something like that but we definitely benefit from seeing something like that that I mean I think that sounds interesting I you know what it makes me think of is what if we had a YA thing akin to um you know adult paranormal romance series for instance where you get the this you know series of books that are coming out pretty frequently where it's got like a a a more condensed story arc but slowly builds the larger world over time um but following different characters like taking that concept and doing something like that in YA fantasy could be interesting yeah Yeah, no that would be that would be really interesting and really beneficial (laughs) Hmm. well if any authors are listening (laughs) or or, (laughs) Do it. <laughs> or edit, uh, you know, publishers. Yeah. I mean, I think, right, that's also the appeal of some books that have gotten huge. I mean, you think about like Harry Potter, for instance, mm-hmm. maybe part of the appeal of it is that you got this cool world. Each story kind of stood alone, had its own story arc, but over time you're building the characters, you're building the world. And I think there's something something to that. And I think honestly, Cassandra Clare does that too, which could be part of the appeal of yeah. that series. Yeah. Um, and I love them, even though, you know, it's one of those, <laughs> it's one of those series where I feel like the sum is more than the, the whole is more than its parts, if that makes any sense. <laughs> right? does, like I does. love the, the, like, I love the ideas and I love the world and the characters she's created, even if some of those early individual books are, you know, not the most amazing. Mm-hmm. I still think it's it's a really compelling world and set of characters. And one thing that I think is really interesting that I think a lot of people didn't know, she was the first mainstream published YA author to have gay relationship and like a kiss on page. 
I did not know that. Yeah. So she was like pretty groundbreaking and including people of color in her cast of characters Mm -hmm. when not a lot of people were doing it. Yeah. And I I mean, I I definitely believe that just thinking about the history of YA and I think that people often forget that YA as an age categorization has mm-hmm. not been around officially for that long. Right. I think I think a lot of people think it's been around longer than than what it has been and I think it's just because of the emphasis on the market on YA right now. So mm-hmm. I'm not surprised a lot of that stuff didn't really come until the early 2000s which is when you start seeing authors like Cassandra Clare and Stephanie Meyer come in and everything that they did, whether we a hundred percent like it or not in 2020, Mm -hmm. I always say, you know, you give credit where credit is due because they were pivotal in Mm -hmm. the whole concept of YA. It's just sometimes, you know, as time goes on, as with any text stuff, just kind of Mm -hmm. ages out with ideas and how we grow as a society. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's interesting to think back, but I that is one thing because, you know, I know she gets flack for a lot of things, but I do think Cassandra Clare is interesting because she was really doing some groundbreaking things and pushed for it when her editors were a little like, well, are people going to freak out about this or ban the books? And she was like, no, we're, we're going to do this because kids need to be able to see like, my, I want my people who are my friends I would would have wanted them to be able to see themselves on page in my books. And so that's Mm. what we're going to do. And, you know, I have a lot of respect for that. One thing pivoting a little bit that I think is really interesting is talking about science fiction in YA, because I feel like I, I don't think that editors, YA editors and publicists are very good at promoting science fiction (laughs) or (laughs) no they're really not um which is unfortunate because sometimes I see fantastic sci-fi series come through that don't get the amount of attention they should because the marketing's off the covers Mm -hmm. are usually terrible and you know they usually don't do a great job of um you know like continuing the careers of these authors whereas I think some imprints like I think of a tour.com for example know mm-hmm. how to nurture the career of a sci-fi author. And I would love to see more sci-fi take hold. Like I so this is a series if you haven't read it, I would love to see you do it because I feel like it would be beneficial maybe for for some of what you do. But have you read the Nixia series by Scott Reinken? No, but I see it. I see it all the time and I they just are, never pick it up. Oh my gosh, they are so good and he's a teacher and teaches a more diverse group of students and wanted his kids to see themselves on the page in a sci-fi book. And so, yeah, they're great. They're so good. And the main character is this Black boy from Detroit who ends up in this elite group of teenagers who go into space with this company to, like, mine this substance called... um, called Nixia. And there are these great, fun, action-packed sci-fi books that would be perfect for teen boys. And they have a diverse cast of characters. They're so well done. And I would love to see them get more attention. Not, I'm, look, listen, I'm literally on, <laughs> I'm on my library's <laughs> website right now, putting the first one on hold. <laughs> awesome. That's all I needed to know. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So like those are, I think, some some good ones. Oh, you know what also actually might be kind of what you're looking for in terms of for boys particularly. But have you read Jason Reynolds, Miles Morales, Spider-Man? I have. (laughs) It is not. I I think it would be great for my guys. I really do. I I'm just a superhero comic freak. So mine was more about how Miles Morales' storyline was carried out. I love oh Jason Reynolds, but it is not my, my favorite of his. <laughs> but I really, do, I really do think my boys would love it. But I yeah. just am super critical anytime that a superhero from Marvel or DC is novelized. And mm-hmm. I had some interesting thoughts about how that one was done. 
That's so interesting. So, okay. So I have not read, like, I, I am a Marvel fan from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I've not really read the comics. And mm. I read that and I loved it. <laughs> I thought it was great. And I liked it because it was one of those things where I was like, okay, this reads like older, middle grade, younger YA. Uh -huh. But it's like a well-known enough character that I feel like, you know, it would be a cool thing for teen boys in particular, getting them into reading. Like, that's one that I've recommended to people quite a bit. Yeah, no, that one definitely is a good jumping point. I just think him in general, Jason Reynolds, a lot of the stuff He's that he great. does in general is really, really great. Especially he writes yeah. with Black boys in mind. And mm -hmm. I think it definitely will be great for them. I just, just been reading and I was like, Jason, I love you, but no. <laughs> so critical, Ashley. <laughs> I'm so critical. And he's like one of my favorite authors. And I was like, I love you to yeah. death, but this just wasn't it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, that's so funny. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think like what else there's, I think this is part of the thing is there's not a lot of big, good sci-fi that comes out in YA and it's such a bummer because I feel like there's sci-fi readers and what yeah, you end up with is teenagers reading adult sci-fi. That's what, that's exactly, you took the words out of my mouth because sitting here really just thinking about sci-fi, even with me trying to get more into sci-fi, Mm -hmm. I really don't know of any YA science fiction that I would be jumping for joy to read right now because I don't feel like, like you said, I don't feel like it's marketed at all. Yeah, no. Okay, so I got to tell you, I am currently reading um, an ERC, an advanced copy of a, an anthology that's about to come out. Well, well by the time this po episode goes up, it'll be out. So um, it's called A Universe of Wishes. It's an anthology, a We Need Diverse Books anthology edited by Daniel Clayton. And I just read a story in it that is a sci-fi short story by Kwame Mbalia. And who it's so good. And I was like, please, can you use this as a jumping off point to write a YA sci-fi novel? Because it would be so cool. Oh, wow. What is it called again, Bethany? The, the it's book? Called it's a, called? Yeah, it's called A Universe of Wishes. Universe and the stories are wishes. really good for the most part. Yeah. I mean, so far the stories have, there's been a lot of really, really good stories in there, but that was one that stood out to me that I was like, we need, we need a book. So his, so for listeners who aren't familiar with him, Kwame Mbalia has written a couple of middle grade books with the Rick Riordan Presents imprint. Um, what was the first one called? I mean, I Tristan up. Strong Punches a oh, Hole in yes, the Sky. Oh, yes. Punches a Hole in the Sky, which was great. Did you read that one? I am still currently reading it. <laughs> <laughs> great. It's really good. Like, I thought it was really clever and interesting, but reading the sci-fi short story he wrote, I was like, this is so cool, and you you need to write a YA sci-fi novel. Well, that makes me really excited to pick it up. Just looking at the list of people who are included on this, this is this is a, it's a great collection of this people. Is a powerful yeah. list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it definitely mm -hmm. is. Yeah, it's a good one. It's one that I'm like, oh, I might actually buy a finished copy of this possibly. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's good. <laughs> I just I just wish they would because there's so I think there's so much space for it, but they just need an editor who knows sci-fi and loves sci-fi and figure out their mm -hmm. marketing team because like the Nixia covers, for instance, are terrible. And the marketing push behind them was not great. The books are amazing, but I wonder if there's if there's a reason why they feel more inclined to push fantasy or go harder for fantasy than science fiction. Because when I think about how much fantasy comes out in, in YA throughout the year, I mean, just a calendar year, it's so much compared yeah. to the few titles that get pushed that are science fiction. Yeah, there. I mean, there are a few that are co that come out that I think are good, but they often I don't I don't know they don't always do that well, even when they're really good. 
which I think is mm-hmm. unfortunate. Like there was, um, and and I think maybe the problem is the way that they're marketed and the readers that they're finding. So a, a great example from 2020 of a sci-fi book that I thought was fantastic. And it's the sort of thing where if it had been published as an adult sci-fi novel, I think it would have found a niche market of people who would have really loved it. But I was one of the few reviewers who who actually liked it a lot, <laughs> um, which is interesting. It's uh, Goddess in the Machine by Laura Beth Johnson. That didn't get a lot of good reviews? No. A lot of people, wow. yeah, like a lot of people thought it was too convoluted. Well, one of the things that a lot of people were annoyed by is that I, I loved is she creates a dialect and I didn't think it was that hard to pick up, but she creates a dialect because it's set a thousand years in the future and kind of imagines how would vernacular English have changed in a thousand years. And I thought it was cool and it was smart. And to me, it felt, made it feel more immersive. But so many reviewers were like, this was weird. It was annoying. I didn't understand it. I couldn't follow it. And I'm like, what? And I wonder if it might be because it was it was marketed more the way you would market fantasy in some ways. And mm. I just wonder if they're not finding the right audience. And I don't know, because I thought it was it was fantastic. It had great twists and turns and a really interesting world. And I loved it, but it just didn't get the play I kind of hoped it would. That's so strange because I felt like there was a lot of buzz around that book. Yeah, well, it got well because it was in a book box. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like it was in a, it was in one of the bigger book boxes, and there was they were definitely pushing it. But like, and it's another one too where honestly, I'm not a huge fan of the covers. Yeah, yeah, the cover, the cover is not. It's not, not great. Not no, it's and, not. Uh, and I was hoping that maybe when it came out in paperback or something, they would change it for like the sequel, but the sequel cover matches the first one. So I'm like, okay, it's a duology. So. Okay. Yeah. I, it's kind of a, like, they don't know how to do sci-fi covers. Like we need some people who know how to do sci-fi covers. Yeah. Because the fantasy covers are always just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. And you need a good cut, like to, that's the thing is to attract the right audience, you need a good cover. That's a big part of the marketing and they just do not do it well. And it's so frustrating. (laughs) I don't know what the solution is, but yeah, I'm just like looking through my list of things I'm excited for next year. And most of the sci-fi I'm looking forward to is from adult imprints, but there are a couple of YA things that looked really interesting. Oh, yes. Okay, hold on. Let me pull this up. There's one that I wanted to mention that I think looks really interesting. Yeah. They do better with like some types of sci-fi than others. I think hard sci-fi in particular tends not mm-hmm. to do super well, but... Okay, so there's one coming out in April from Simon Pulse that's called The Infinity Courts by Akemi Don Bowman. The cover is really beautiful, and it sounds interesting um, because, but, like, this is the kind of thing that I think can do well in YA because it's got, like, a romantic element to it. It's got, like, I, I, I think this might get picked up better, but it follows an 18 year old girl who is on her way to like just graduated high school is on her way to a big party with the boy she's been in love with and then she's murdered before she gets there and wakes up in a place where human consciousness goes when physical bodies die and discovers that Ophelia a virtual assistant widely used by humans on earth has taken over the afterlife and is now posing as a queen forcing humans into servitude like what? <laughs> the way she'd been forced to serve in real the real world this is so wild. It's like, I think the concept here is so interesting. That's wild. Yeah. Like, what if Siri, you know, <laughs> like started taking over? That sounds over like and... some Black Mirror yes. type of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's super interesting. So that's like one of the few YA sci-fi books that look interesting that I'm seeing coming up. But mostly, like most of the things on my list are from adult authors. And that cover is beautiful. It is beautiful, yeah. 
recommend people go go look it up the the books are always listed in the show notes but yeah it's a beautiful cover okay so one question that i think is interesting that comes up with these topics a lot especially with fantasy with YA fantasy is how do you think about or feel about the aging up of a lot of YA because you know as as a market a, a large portion of the people buying and reading YA are now adults not teenagers and i think you see a lot of books targeting a crossover market on purpose especially in fantasy and you know i have mixed feelings about it like i i like some of it but also i think and and you know there's a pull back this direction on some level sometimes but um but I, but you also need to have some, some YA that is actually written for teenagers and i think it's interesting that that is a dichotomy that you might not expect well for me as a librarian that actually makes my job a lot harder mm. because what ends up happening is that when they have now begun the process of aging YA up, it Mm -hmm. leaves out a whole bracket of teens that I serve, particularly around the ages of 12 to 14. It is very, very hard to find YA books content-wise that are suitable and sometimes also writing style. I mean, depending upon what community you're working with, Mm -hmm. But it's really, really difficult finding content-wise stuff that is appropriate for ages 12 to 14, which in libraries across the nation, people start their teen programs or teen advisory boards or their teen selections with 12-year-olds in mind. We don't consider them to be middle school, even if they are still in middle school. We don't Mm -hmm. consider them necessarily to be middle school. We look at that as the start of being a part of any type of teen services at the library. And that includes teen literature. So when they do that, while I understand in terms of who's buying and who's reading, Mm -hmm. it's hurting kids at the same time. And the age categorization of YA was not built for adults to now lean back on reading YA. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't want that to Mm -hmm. come across as if, you know, adults shouldn't read because read what you want to read. I wish more adults read kids books, but, (laughs) (laughs) but by taking a whole entire market it, and now you're looking at at an older age group, you're taking away the purpose of why it was developed in the first place. And it bothers me a little bit because at the end of the day, I think we, we forget that to be a publishing company is to be a business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they still have to do what they have to do in terms of, of business ventures and following market trends. So -hmm. you can't really fault them for that if that's the way the money is moving, honestly. I mean, you have to keep your business afloat. But at the same time, I'm kind of torn because it's like I understand, but then I don't understand because you're hurting a whole generation of readers by doing that, by catering to older audiences that are fascinated with YA. And it's true. I see it in the library as well. There are Mm -hmm. lots of adults who come in the doors and it's tricky for us because in a lot of our spaces, we create boundaries Mm -hmm. where if you're not in between the ages of 12 to 18 or 12 to 19, you can't be in the teen area because Mm -hmm. it's supposed to be a safe space for our kids. Mm -hmm. You won't believe the amount of adults that are coming to a library and they're like, is it okay? Like if I go, I just want to go check out some books. Mm -hmm. And they literally are just going there to check out books for themselves. So it's it's working, but it's so unfortunate because then, you know, we have 13-year-olds, 12-year-olds that come and they're like, oh, you know, I want a fantasy book. And it's like, okay, I know you really don't want to go to the kids section, mm-hmm. but if I take you to the YA section, I'm, I'm looking through all these shelves and I'm like, okay, well, what's appropriate content-wise? Because I don't want to give you something and then you read it and then, you know, your parents get upset because of the con- It's It's such right. a tricky situation to navigate and it really does put us in a tough spot as well yeah no that makes sense and it's interesting well and this is why 
I, I do sometimes try to say in reviews if I feel like something was written for more for teenagers, you really should check out the Brooklyn Bruja series because I think that is a good series that you could give to younger teens mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. terms of content. Um, I also think, I don't know about 12 necessarily, but I feel like Daniel Clayton writes for teenagers. Yeah, um, yeah, she does. Yeah, she does. <laughs> Like her books just read that way. Mm -hmm. um, and and actually, in terms of YA sci-fi, Alexa Dunn's books, her first two books were kind of sci-fi re retellings of classics set in space that also read mm -hmm. like they were written for teenagers. Um, so Brightly Burning is a Jane Eyre retelling set in space. And then The Stars We Steal is Persuasion set in space and both okay. of them feel very much like they were written for teen audiences mm -hmm. uh, but I also find that interesting too just from the author perspective where I wonder if we're starting to get into this conflict of where if your characters are in between the ages of 12 to 18 then it makes it YA because I feel like sometimes that's the direction that it's headed in because there have been some YA books that I've been reading recently mm -hmm. that have very much so even in my age I'm like questioning I don't know if I would even give this to my teens just yet because mm -hmm. of the content and it makes things difficult when we're trying to I guess, kind of figure out what is truly YA and what is adult, which is why I think the year of the witching is a good example because that that's book, adult. <laughs> it, it, it's clearly adult, but I know that a lot of people were saying like it was YA. And then even Alexis had got on Twitter and was saying that it was a problem because people were saying, or it was being marketed as oh, YA no. and she's like no it's not it's not it's sold as adult like it's priced as an adult book <laughs> and I think the issue is once again going back to that whole idea that because the character within that book fits into the the framework of a, a teenager yeah then that I would make like it a YA book so. oh lord so <sighs> it causes so many problems in yeah in like I said, I understand why, because it, mm -hmm. it is a marketing thing. But at the same time, it starts to really convolute the difference between YA and adult and leaving yeah. out a whole group of, of readers in doing so. Yeah. I will say I've seen this sort of thing happen even in books where the characters are in their mid-20s. And I've noticed mm -hmm. a pattern that frequently, very frequently when you have a woman writing adult speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy, or horror, especially women of color, but really women in general, people are always mm -hmm. like, oh, it's YA because women write YA, I guess. Like women, <laughs> women can't write adult speculative fiction. <laughs> like apparently that seems. So I also think there's an honestly like kind of an issue of misogyny that like goes along with it. And I know it's not intentional, but I see so many people do this like over and over and over again, even reviewers and creators that I, you know, respect and their opinions and stuff. I'll see them do this and I'll try to gently be like, oh, hey, yeah, that's actually not YA. Like, you know, like, but it happens. I mean, at least like I would say probably weekly I see this happening and it's it's kind of frustrating. Yeah, it is. It definitely is frustrating. But yeah, Year of the Witching is definitely not not written for no. teenagers. Um, no. Not at all. Not in the least bit. It is an adult horror novel. <laughs> it is. It definitely is. In many ways. Yes. Yes. Oh man. Yeah, it's um it's it's interesting. There are also books that I've read that I really liked that I was like, this shouldn't have been published as YA, even though the character is young. I think a great example is The Hazelwood by Melissa Albert. It's a great book. I loved it. It is not a YA book. It, sh I, th I think, should have been published as an adult novel. But the character okay. is 17, and they published it as YA. But, like, it, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, I wish I wish that that state of mind of, of associating 
the age of the character with the actual age categorization categorization of the book. I wish that would stop being like a correlation because it's not. I think you, yeah. you can have an adult book that has a teenage character or you can have a YA book that has older characters. I just don't think that that needs to be associated with one or the other because it causes problems Yeah, with the target audience. Yeah. It's interesting because I think another thing I'm starting to see, which I think is filling a gap and I'm glad to see it, but also I wish that new adult wasn't sort of dead in the publishing world as a term. Um, but I'm seeing more YA books published with characters who are like early college years, which I think mm -hmm. is great. I think, you know, and not new adult in the sense of like they're super sexy books, but uh, a great example of one that just came out that I, you know, not sci not science fiction and fantasy, but um, Rent a Boyfriend by Gloria Chow, which is a romantic comedy. And mm -hmm. the main character is a freshman in college and the love interest is like 21. Okay. So I'm starting to see more of those kinds of things get published as well, where the characters are early in college, which is great because I think those are important books to have. But, you know, should there be some kind of a split or recategorization of these different markets? Yeah, or a bridge, like creating mm -hmm. that bridge. I know that was that was a big thing a few years ago mm -hmm. in trying to create that bridge between what happens when you as a reader age out of YA, but you're not ready to step into adult, what happens then? <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, and you can, I guess you can follow an author. Like you think about Sarah J Mass is now firmly writing adult novels and I think doesn't plan to go back to YA, which is interesting. Oh, really? Mm hmm I did not know that, but I, I when I watched your, your video, uh, your, tw was it 21, romance releases for 2021 yeah I was I was laughing when you said that <laughs> she said that this upcoming book is her dirtiest book yet and I was like yeah. oh really <laughs> <laughs> yes oh, oh, really? Part of Silver Flames. yeah that's what she said I saw her in like a live stream talking about it um which is interesting but yeah no her and she what's interesting is the Akatar series she always wanted to publish as adults but her editors were like no we don't think it'll sell that way so we're just gonna say it's YA and say it's like 16 and up and that yeah. caused so that caused so many issues for us <laughs> as, as librarians I can't tell you the amount of issues that that oh, series it's caused us um, such I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, now they are officially being published as adult novels with new covers. I don't love the new covers, but I'm glad they're being recategorized. <laughs> Good. And she's Good. been doing a lot of events now with adult romance and paranormal romance authors, too, because I think she really wants to rebrand herself that way. So like J.R. Ward and Christina Lauren and stuff like that. So her her book, Cre the Crescent City, or I I don't know which yeah. one is actually the right House title. Of and Blood. Crescent City, okay. is the, 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 series, series. the series title. That cover was done. <laughs> it was just so confusing. But yeah. so is that an adult title then? Yes, it is. Okay, okay, okay. It is. Yeah. Although that one, well, I don't. I wouldn't say this for later in the series, but like that one, I would be comfortable giving to like a sixteen year old. Okay. Um, but it is an adult title. Yeah. Um, okay. And I think the next book in the series is probably going to have more. That one actually doesn't really have that much. It has a lot of cursing in it and like okay. sexy joking and stuff, but it doesn't have a lot of explicit content. The next book in the series, I pre I'm pretty sure will. <laughs> though, so. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a good, it's a great book. I really enjoyed it a lot, but yeah, it's an ad adult title and she is very clearly trying to pivot and rebrand herself as an adult author. Okay. Okay. Which is interesting. Yeah. But one thing that's fun, I like this. I like when authors do this kind of thing, but there are little Easter eggs that show that all her books are set in the same universe or in parallel universes, all her different series. So I heard, so mm -hmm. I have heard mm -hmm. that they are. <laughs> it's very fun. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah. So there's some like there's some parallels between the Throne of Glass series, the Akatar series, and the Crescent City series, where I think they're in like kind of parallel universes. Huh. See, now that makes me more interested because you know I was in the process of going back through and re reading the Throne of Glass series, mm -hmm. and I was doing one a month and doing a reading vlog for each one. And, you know, I, I stopped COVID and all that stuff. It just kind of threw mm -hmm. me, it threw me off track with everything that's happened in 2020, sure. but it makes me kind of want to go back and, and finish up and see how they're all interconnected. <laughs> I like stuff like that. I do too. I, I love find it. Stuff it's like that very fascinating. Yeah. 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 No. It's fun. And I think, I think, the connections are going to become more apparent as we go on. And I wouldn't be surprised. We'll see, but like given some plot things in the different books, I wouldn't be surprised if we eventually get a crossover book between Akatar and Crescent City. All right, Bethany, thank you for <laughs> selling me on now needing to really, and it's so crazy because I just made a video. I was like, I'm not pressed to finish any series by <laughs> Claire J. Mack or Cassandra Clare, like, I'm going to do it, but I don't feel pressured to do it. And here we go. <laughs> and he's like, well, actually, you know, all this stuff is interconnected. And, okay, so what you're telling me is I need to go ahead and really actually finish these books. I mean, you could, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. 2021 goals. Hey. <laughs> I would I would like to go back and do a reread of Throne of Glass at some point because it's been such a long time since I read all of them. But um, they're fun. I will say her books keep getting longer and they're like too long, but they're still enjoyable. Um, I don't know. I'm like, this could have been edited. It could have been a hundred or so pages shorter, but it was still fun. <laughs> uh. Oh, can I ask you a question? Sure. <laughs> so if you could if you could recommend to someone your top five YA fantasy of all time, what would they be? Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is only because you asked me a tough question earlier. <laughs> oh my goodness. Seriously, my top five YA fantasy of all time. Oh, that's hard. Hmm. Or like the last two to three years, if that helps narrow it. Yeah. But you read a lot. You read like three hundred. I do books read a lot. <laughs> Oh, it's like a thousand books this <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm trying to think of like, um, oh, okay. So you know what? And this this is kind of a crossover, I would say, between middle grade and YA. And it's a throwback. But also, Ashley, you should give this to your readers if you don't already. Um, but the Song of the Lioness series by Tamora Pierce Yes, someone has been trying to get me to read those for you. You haven't years. read them. Oh my God. No, okay. No. Okay. Look, you know what? I've reread them multiple times. I would be up, like, if you ever, if you wanted to do like a read along thing. 2021? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I would be down. They are, they are so good. And what's cool about them is that quartet. It's really a crossover. They're easy to read. They're not very long, but they have like a really great world and the characters are awesome. And the main character at the beginning of the story is like nine or 10. And by the end, she's like 20. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And so to see her age. Yeah. They're really cool. It's got like a female character who becomes a knight and then discovers she has magic. Um, there's magical birth control when she eventually becomes sexually active. It's like, it's great. What? It's like a fantastic series. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. Um, but that, that is one that, and I think it's one that ages well, cause I reread them a few years ago and I still, it's, I, they still just hold up really well. So, um, that's a favorite for me for sure. I, so I do think the shadow hunter books in general from Cassandra Clare are really good just cause the world and some of the characters are so iconic and that's kind of sprawling, <laughs> but, 
uh, I think the the series the the series that starts with Lady Midnight is a really good one where I think her writing at that point had just improved significantly. But even early on, you know, great characters, really cool world that like you want to be a part of, and so I still kind of love that series. Um, oh. What else? There's been like a lot of, it's hard too, because like, there's been a lot of cool things that have come out mm-hmm. the first book in a series. And I'm like, okay, the first book is really strong, but how is the follow-up going to be, you know? Yeah, because we don't want to get disappointed like we have. No, like we like have. have. This year. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Um, cause that's, that's, uh, that's rough. I wish I had, like, I don't have my YA fantasy shelves in front of me, so I'm trying to like, okay, it's okay. That's, that's trying to think like, <laughs> like what all is on there. Um, I know I'm probably forgetting something like super significant that I should be thinking of, but it's fine. It's fine. It's <laughs> I do fun. think one that I think, um, is YA sci-fi, but would appeal to fantasy readers that I think is great is the Lunar Chronicles by Marissa Meyer. Yeah, I still haven't finished that either. <laughs> yeah, I, I just think they're super fun. I mean, it's like sci-fi retellings of fairy tales. They're yeah. very readable, and I, th- I think that's a that's kind of like a good classic series um, at this point. Okay. I don't know. It's and we'll see. Like, there's been some really good books that have come out this year that I'm kind of like waiting to see how they go. Like, mm-hmm. Lobizona by Romina Garber was fantastic. Raybearer by Jordan e. Fuego was like yes, amazing was so for a debut. Cool. Yeah, so I live. I have like very high hopes for the sequels to those, but they're not out yet. So I'm like, okay, don't disappoint me. <laughs> I can't wait for you to read Legendborn. Yeah, I'm. So where am I actually? I can look. I'm. I am on a, a wait list with my library, and I'm getting close to the top of the list. So it's coming. I'm guessing in January. I'm number seven in line for two copies of the audiobook. Okay. So, so like probably that'll happen in January. I think that will put us at about time. Thank you so much for joining me, Ashley. This was really interesting and super fun conversation. (laughs) I loved it. (laughs) Again, this has been Chapter 3 Podcast, and I'm your host, Bethany. You can follow us on Twitter at Chapter 3 Podcast, and you can also find me on YouTube at Beautifully Bookish Bethany if you want even more bookish content from me. The next episode will be available in two weeks, and this episode's bonus content, which we're going to record right after this, will be available to patrons within the next few days. Thanks for listening.